Japanese midget submarines reflected the nation's ingenuity and the advance of naval warfare. The vessels were not small. Each Type A midget submarine measured 78 and a half feet in length and weighed 46 tons. A two-man crew consisted of a junior officer who commanded the boat and an enlisted man who acted primarily as helmsman. The Type A could manage 19 knots submerged and had a potential maximum range of 100 miles if running on the surface at a conservative two knots. The midget would approach its target surfaced until diving for the final attack run. These ingenious midget submarines were delivered into action, lashed to the decks of much larger fleet submarines, which acted as mother submarines during the operations. Several Type A midget submarines had been used during the attack on Pearl Harbor, the 7th of December, 1941, with mixed results. The Imperial Japanese Navy High Command was keen to use these weapons in further attacks on U.S., British, and Commonwealth naval bases around the world. During World War II, Madagascar, now the Malagasy Republic, was a French colony. It was ruled by the Vichy French collaborationist regime set up by the Nazis in southern France after the French surrender in June 1940. Both the Germans and the Japanese had designs on basing submarines in Madagascar so they could prey on Allied convoys in the Indian Ocean. Madagascar had been invaded and occupied by the British between May 1942 and the eventual Vichy French capitulation in November in an effort to deny the Japanese port facilities for their submarines in the Western Indian Ocean. Had the Japanese managed to persuade the Vichy authorities to allow them to have base submarines in Madagascar, as they had persuaded the collaborationist government to allow Japanese troops and aircraft into French Indochina just prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, such a move would have placed the Japanese in an ideal position. With the successful conquest of northern Madagascar and the crushing of Vichy French resistance in that region by May 1942, the utilization of the port of Diego Suarez as an Allied naval base became possible. Japanese, however, were determined to attack the anchorage and hopefully destroy several of the warships moored within in a surprise attack, employing the Type A midget submarine and the long-range I-class boats. In Diego Suarez Harbor on the 30th of May, there was a collection of Allied warships and supply vessels riding at anchor. HMS Karanja, Genister, Time, Duncan, and Active, all convoy escorts, were berthed alongside a hospital ship, the Atlantis, the merchantman Hlandaf Castle, and an ammunition ship. A bigger fish for the Japanese to attempt to fry was the battleship HMS Ramillies. HMS Ramillies was a revenge-class battleship constructed during the First World War that entered service in 1917. But by 1942, she and her surviving sisters were considered outdated, too small and too slow for frontline combat. Instead, the 28,000-ton Ramillies, armed with four 15-inch main guns, had been assigned convoy escort duties in the Western Indian Ocean. On the evening of the 30th of May, the Japanese fleet submarines I-16 and I-20 had each launched a midget submarine several miles off the Madagascar anchorage. A third midget launch being cancelled aboard the submarine I-18 owing to mechanical problems. The two midgets would attempt to penetrate the port of Diego Suarez undetected and search out targets among a large number of British warships and merchant ships moored inside. The commanding officers of the two midget submarines, Ensign Katsuzuke Iwase and Lieutenant Suburo Akieda, clambered aboard their midgets with their two petty officer helmsmen. All four men were armed with Type 14 Nambu pistols, and the two commanders also carried short Wakazashi samurai swords. And highlighting the Japanese military's adherence to the samurai's bushido code, which upheld the virtues of man-to-man -man combat in a machine age, and demanded that the Japanese soldier die rather than surrender. As they approached the shallow harbor, the Japanese crewmen dived their submarines to hopefully avoid Allied watchmen and penetrated the port undetected. Darkness had fallen, but the light of a full moon bathed the busy anchorage and array of ships. Crewmen on the decks of the huge HMS Ramillies and aboard the nearby tanker British Loyalty reported that they saw two conning towers negotiating the harbour entrance. 
Though strangely no immediate action was taken, at 8.25pm, Akieda began his torpedo attack. Lining up on the Ramillies, Akieda launched a single torpedo at the battleship. A few seconds later, there was an enormous explosion that lit up the harbour, a massive plume of flame, debris and black smoke climbing into the humid night air as the Ramillies reeled from the torpedo strike. A 30-foot hole had been blown in the side of the ship, water flooding into the steaming gash in her side. Although the ship's damage control parties managed to save her from settling onto the muddy bottom of the harbour, intermittent power and communication failures throughout the rest of the night made their jobs very difficult. Fortunately for the British, Akieda must have assumed that he had crippled the battleship with a single strike because he did not immediately launch his remaining torpedo at her. Close by, the captain of the British loyalty ordered the crew to swing out the boats and to raise the anchor. He rang the engine room telegraph to order the engineers to stand by, but it was to take the tanker almost an hour to begin to move away from her berth. In the meantime, Royal Navy corvettes, fast anti-submarine vessels, raced around the port, depth charging any suspicious targets in the hope of preventing further attacks. A signalman aboard the damaged Ramillies was searching the water for signs of the invisible attacker when he saw the unmistakable wake of a torpedo running fast in the bright moonlight, heading not for the warship, but travelling to intercept the British loyalty. The tanker was reversing noisily in its manoeuvres from its berth, directly into the path of the oncoming Japanese torpedo that was obviously intended to finish off the stricken Ramillies. Another booming explosion rolled out over the harbour, the British loyalty began to sink rapidly by the stern, and her captain ordered his crew to abandon ship. Five crewmen were killed aboard the British loyalty, but the loss of the tanker undoubtedly saved the battleship. Akieda now attempted to leave the harbour and rendezvous with the I-20 for recovery, but his midget ran aground, and he was forced, along with his navigator, to abandon the vessel and swim to shore. The Japanese sailors were determined that they would not allow themselves to be captured by the British, and the two men set off on a long march across northern Madagascar, hoping to be able to signal the I-20 from shore and be rescued. Cornered by British Royal Marines on the 2nd of June, after 59 hours on the loose, Akieda and Petty Officer Takimoto determined to go down fighting. Armed with two pistols and Akieda's short sword, the Japanese submariners managed to kill one British soldier and wound four others before they themselves perished in the firefight. The fate of Ensign Iwase and the other midget submarine remains a mystery to the present day, though it is surmised that he was probably sunk by mechanical failure or destroyed by British depth charging. The body of an unidentified Japanese crewman was washed up some hours afterwards. The British immediately suppressed details of the Diego Suarez attack, and incredibly, they issued no warnings to other British and Commonwealth naval bases concerning the possibility of similar attacks being attempted by the Japanese. Some 17 hours later, the port of Sydney in Australia would be attacked by Japanese midget submarines with devastating results. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share and also help support my channel at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.